Today we are proud and honored to roll out the red, black, and green carpet for Dr. Gerald Horn. Dr. Gerald Horn holds the Rebecca Moore Chair of History and African American Studies at the uh, University of Houston. As far as his educational background, he got his Ph.D. from Columbia, uh, J.D. from UCAL at Berkeley, and he has a B.A. from Princeton University. Princeton University. And so uh, he's also published a number of books, including Race to Revolution, the U.S. and Cuba during slavery and Jim Crow, Black Revolutionary, William Patterson and the Globalization of the African-American Freedom Struggle, W.E.B. Du Bois Biography, Mau Mau in Harlem, and Race Woman, The Lives of Shirley Graham Du Bois. So the topic that we're discussing today is um, From Slavery to Sovereignty. And when we were thinking about guests to interview on this topic, obviously you came up because of your extensive works. And um, that's basically what this interview is centered around. That's the theme. And so because of your primary focus being on our experience here in America and by our, of course, I mean the black experience, uh, I wanted to take the audience back to the founding of this country. Uh, you wrote a great book and I caught you on C-SPAN, by the way, this past uh, this past weekend. And uh, the name of the book was The Counter-Revolution of 1776. And you also wrote another book called Race to Revolution. And uh, we talk about how the United States was founded in defense of slavery rather than in the name of liberty. So what led you to that conclusion? What led me to that conclusion was, first of all, looking at the evidence. And second right. of all, the it was the culmination of many years of research. Uh, if you look at the books that I've written and the years in which I've published them, you may note that I've been sort of marching backward in time. That's right. From the 20th century back to 1776. And in fact, that book starts in 1688. And I'm about to start a book that'll probably start in 1600. Why 1600 and 1688? <clears throat> well, 1688, in the 1776 book, because it marks the so-called glorious revolution in England, mm. which has significant impact on people of African descent because what it means is that the wings of the monarchy, the king, are clipped and that leads to the deregulation of the African slave trade, which theretofore had been under the thumb of the monarchy, the Royal African Company. And with deregulation, that trade was opened up to the rising merchant class mm. who then descended upon Africa with the maniacal energy of crazed bees manacling and <laughs> handcuffing every African in sight which of course leads to the takeoff of capitalism it leads to a new stage in the history of the Americas and so that's why 1688 now this next book basically it's going to really start in the middle of the 17th century, that is to say the mid-1600s, and one of the things I'll be looking at is the ouster of Spain from Jamaica mm -hmm. by the British in 1655, and how that ties into possibly the religious wars and the civil war that is racking England at that time, and what the repercussions may have been for people of African descent. Mm. Mm, okay, so deregulation is one of the principal factors behind slavery becoming the cottage industry that it became. Is that right? Yeah, free trade in Africans is what I call it. In other words, the trade has opened up. It's uh, opened up to it's like deregulation, deregulating any other enterprise. That's right. That takes place. So slavery was immensely profitable. It was immensely popular for nations seeking to, to come out of their own economic morass. Why would these nations ultimately abolish slavery? I know we're skipping ahead a little bit, but this is a question that many, uh, many of us ask. Why would these nations abolish slavery if it was so profitable? Well, it's also bloody. And many of these merchants and entrepreneurs and capitalists, they're not necessarily suicide bombers. That is to say That's right. that when you manacle and handcuff Africans and drag them across the Atlantic, they're not very happy. And <laughs> they're willing to revolt. They're willing to cut your throat. And the point descends that the better part of wisdom 
might be the move towards abolishing slavery rather than lose one's life. But, of course, in the 1776 book, I tell another story, which is how, because of unique reasons in Spain, they were forced to both enslave Africans and arm Africans. Mm. They had to arm Africans because, well, the British said they had to arm Africans because, according to the Londoners, so many men were going into the priesthood that they had a deficit in terms of soldiers. Mm. And so they had no choice but to create a free uh, Negro class and then arm them. Then that puts competitive pressure on Britain to do the same, particularly after 1740, 1741, when the Spanish administered a stinging defeat upon the British on the northern coast of, of South America in the city we refer to as Cartagena, uh, where the Spanish uh, armed Africans who then defeated the Redcoats and the Redcoats in London were coming to realize that if they were going to compete for the colonial booty, then they had to emulate the best practices. And the best practices meant arming Africans. The British also had a problem because the Irish were not considered to be politically reliable because of a bone they had to pick with England stretching back centuries. That's and right. indeed, a number of leaders of the Spanish military were in fact Irish. And you may have noted <laughs> that... Uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a referendum in Scotland to bolt from the United Kingdom. Scotland only become part of the UK formally in That's 1707, right. and there was still restiveness in, Scot in Scotland, and it was felt that they were not politi <clears throat> politically reliable either. And so the British were being pushed into a corner to arm Africans, but then this was outraging and incensing the North American settlers who felt that... Uh, Africans should not be armed. The, the only way you should do, have Africans in arms in the same sentence is using arms to march Africans at gunpoint into the cotton fields. And That's the right. Fields, for example. And so this is creating a, a, a fissure and a riff that ultimately culminates in a revolt against British rule leading to the foundation of the nation of the United States of America. Mm, mm. And that is why you propose that the uh, revolution of 1776 was to defend slavery rather than to uh, to perpetrate some myth of uh, uh, of liberty and freedom, which it was for them. We understand that, but not so much for us. Well, that's for sure. But what's <laughs> particularly maddening and perhaps saddening is that there are those who consider themselves to be humanitarians, and mm. yet they have been drinking the Kool Aid. They have accepted the propaganda that a war to defend slavery led to the foundation of a country, they say, that was a great leap forward for humanity, even though it led to even more increased enslavement, because mm. you know that after 1776, the United States replaced Britain as the captain of the international slave trade, and Britain moved towards abolition. And we also know that after 1776, there was enhanced, accentuated genocidal practices practiced against the indigenous population. That's right. And yet, somehow, we are told, we are led and meant to believe that this was a great leap forward for humanity. I mean, uh, this is not only a calloused point of view, it's a bizarre point of view, and ultimately, it's a sad point of view. That's right. That's right. So, fast forward slavery has endured in the United States and it's brought to an end by the Civil War um, and a number of rebellions that led up to that as well. Those rebellions, of course, contributed to the population's opinion that uh, abolition was the way forward. So after slavery, the subject of reparations and back to Africa movements started to, to spring up uh, as a solution to what do we do with this newly freed Negro population? Do we send them back to where they came from? Or do we pay them off to keep them quiet? Do we give them their own lands and their own means of establishing themselves and hope that they become participants in this system that we've built? So my question to you is um, the reparations fight continues today. If we won that fight, where should reparations be allocated? And should that be a fight that we're even still engaged in? Well, I think so, but I think it has to be engaged in differently. I mm. mean... It never ceases to amaze me that if you talk to many black people, so say at a tavern or a bar, immediately, if not inevitably, the conversation turns to how retrograde and backwards the mass of Euro-Americans are. True. 
on many if issues. But yet at the same time, when they conduct their reparation struggle, they act as if these people they consider backward will somehow be convinced, I don't know how, to <laughs> and their representatives to provide reparations. I mean, it's a non sequitur. I mean, it doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense. Now, if you're going to conduct a reparation struggle with any sort of ability to triumph, well, obviously you have to win on the battlefield. You have to make it an international question. That's right. I mean, you have to link up with the CARICOM nations uh, who are suing Britain as we speak. You have and, to, and who are the CARICOM nations? Oh, sorry, the Caribbean nations, you know, mm-hmm. Guyana, Jamaica, Barbados, That's right. Trinidad and Tobago, et cetera. I mean, you have to raise it at the African Union. I mean, you have to raise it with the BRICS nation, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. You have to raise it with, with, with the leading nations in the world, though, particularly those who have a bone to pick with the United States. That's right. And I think our grandchildren, who, the ones who look back on this, they'll be scratching their heads in befuddlement, saying, <laughs> well, how, you know, these people, you're always, talking, you're always talking about how backwards these Euro-Americans are, but yet they conduct this monumental profound struggle for reparations presumably on the premise that you just it has to be waged within the four corners of the United States of America mm. I mean, it's no sense mm. that's right so you believe that we should conduct the fight differently by linking up with international organizations and nations who have an interest in uh, seeing reparations are paid as well is that right oh absolutely and, and, and of course what we'll find is that we have many friends and allies I mean uh, I scratch my head about this almost on a daily basis, sometimes <laughs> on an hourly basis, because, you know, you look at the situation in Ferguson, Missouri, look at all the other outrages and crimes that are perpetrated against our people on a regular basis, and yet there doesn't seem to be within our intellectuals and in our leaders the ability to follow the historical lessons which got us to this point in the first place, which mm. is that our struggle has to be internationalized. I think the answer is is that the latest stage of our struggle, which, let's say, commences on May 17, 1954, with Brown versus Board of Education, That's the decision right. of the Supreme Court saying that Jim Crow apartheid in the United States somehow was unconstitutional, that led to an erosion of Jim Crow. It created favorable conditions for affluence for some of our people, which helped to introduce class cleavages, helped to induce a certain kind of ideological confusion, which mm-hmm. leads to this present status quo, because obviously, if you've done well financially in the United States of America, and the dictum or the principle or the ideology of the United States of America is and when you raise to rise to a certain class position, well then You're a U.S. national. You don't go outside the bounds of the United States. That's right. And certainly that seems to be the viewpoint of some of our brothers and sisters who've done well within the present system. And presumably they've influenced (laughs) even some of us who haven't done very well. Mm. That leads to this present uh, ideological confusion and logjam and these sorts of uh, this kind of kabuki theater where uh, (laughs) reparation struggle is waged in the four corners of the United States when we already know these folks, they don't even want affirmative action. So how are you going to get reparations? Mm. I mean, they, but, but as I said, that's I, mean, right, I think that's, that's an right. explanation for what I've just explained. True indeed. Well, if, we, if we're going on to the battlefield, we're linking up with CARICOM, we're linking up with the BRICS nation, we're linking up with the AU, and we actually achieve those ends, where should reparations be allocated? Because that's another part of the debate. The debate is, well... And I I know you've heard this statement before. If you gave Negroes in the United States reparations, the day of Foot Locker stock would reach a new high. The day of BMW stock would reach a new high because all we do is squander those reparations on consumer goods. So what are your thoughts in terms of how reparations should be allocated? Is that even a, a, a discussion we should be having? Well, I noticed that sovereignty is in the headline of our discussion. That's right. Today. And uh, I'm inferring from your question that you're pushing me to contemplate the question of sovereignty. That's right. And once again, that's a very profound and complicated question. And once again, given the fact 
that there are those in the United States who don't even want us to have the right to vote. True indeed. Let alone have the right to exercise sovereignty. It would have to be internationalized if we were to put sovereignty on the table. It, it just can't be a domestic question. And that is a debate worth having. Uh, fortunately, there are historical examples to look at. I mean, you know that in the 1930s there was this 49th state movement. Uh, that's to say before the... That's right. ...of Hawaii and Alaska right. making 49 and 50 states. You know that in the 1930s there was the idea of a black belt republic uh, that the Communist Party put forward. We know that in the history of the United States, Oklahoma historically was supposed to be the land of the Native Americans. That's just one more treaty. That's right. Native Americans that these Euro-American elites did not adhere to. So the you also know, if you look at my book, Black and Brown, on Black Americans in the Mexican Revolution, 1910 to 1920, you'll find a plan to set up independent Black and Native American republics on the land seized from Mexico during the criminal and illegal war of 1846 to 1848. Mm. So there are many historical examples of sovereignty. But once again, I don't think the intellectual attention and firepower matches the profundity and the weight of the question. True indeed. And I, I definitely agree. It's a fight that we uh, it, it's a battle that we engage in on an intellectual front uh, on a daily on a daily. And in fact, the very definition of sovereignty varies from from thinker to thinker, from person to person and organization to organization. And so, you know, I in, in no veiled terms, I believe that sovereignty or pardon me, I believe that reparations are a path to sovereignty or they should be now. I want to take a step back from the discussion on sovereignty for just a quick second because we are in the wake of the Ferguson grand jury decision to not indict Officer Darren Wilson, and you touched on that very briefly. Uh, I want to know, what was your initial reaction to hearing that um, the officer who killed Mike Brown would not be indicted? What was your initial reaction? Well, disappointed, not surprised. Uh, That's right. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and as a youth, I used to visit the old courthouse in downtown St. Louis where the case of Dred Scott was litigated. Recall that that was the case in 1857 where the U.S. Supreme Court decided that, uh, as they put it, blacks had no rights that whites were bound to respect. That's right. And the cloud of Dred Scott still ominously hangs not only over St. Louis but the nation as a whole. Having said that, it's apparent that the St. Louis prosecutorial authorities were not ready for prime time. I mean, <laughs> the, the way they botched that case, I mean, they could have been a bit more elegant in letting Officer Wilson walk, but I, I, they weren't very sophisticated. That's right. About what they sought to do. I mean, we can all agree that it was clumsy. I mean, oh. the, the entire media circus that surrounded it, uh, the announcement itself, um, uh, the lack of transparency with the indictment, uh, or lack thereof, rather, the entire situation could be could be considered clumsy, you know. Surely, and it also <laughs> illustrates some of the points that I've been trying to make thus far. Mm. One is that the most incisive and sharp analysis on television of Ferguson came from Press TV of Iran, CCTV mm. China. RT of Moscow, Telesur of Venezuela, mm. and you should also know that there were raucous demonstrations in London and in, right. in Italy with regard to this Ferguson situation. You should also know that shortly after the failure to indict a leading body in the United Nations issued a stinging rebuke of the United States for its maltreatment and mistreatment of African Americans in particular. True indeed. This body in Geneva, Switzerland of the United Nations heard testimony from the parents of Michael Brown who mm -hmm. traveled to Geneva. They heard testimony from a young group of African Americans from Chicago who took the name We Charge Genocide mm. who testified 
that name, We Charge Genocide, should resonate with some of your listeners because recall that it was circa 1950, 1951 that Paul Robeson and William Patterson filed a petition with the United Nations charging genocide against African Americans by the U.S. authorities. Mm. And so, in many ways, Ferguson is illustrating what I'm trying to bring to you this afternoon, and I think that one of the reasons why the case has gained traction is precisely because of this global and international component. It's an object lesson for us all. True indeed. True indeed. Now, the reason why I wanted to touch on that, I want to tie the two concepts that we've been discussing together. Those concepts being a discussion on reparations and race relations uh, and the Ferguson decision. I see these as a catalyst to bring the discussion of sovereignty to the table. Now, you teach graduate courses in diplomatic history, labor history, uh, African-American history. Based on your knowledge of history, do you believe it's possible for African-Americans to achieve sovereignty? And if so, what are some ways we as individual groups uh, can do that now? And what has been done in the past to take steps forward towards sovereignty? Well, I think it's possible up to and including a nation state because there are forms of sovereignty below that of the nation state. True indeed. But once again, <laughs> that's a very profound demand. That's a very profound project. And I don't really see it taking place without some sort of international component. I hate to sound like a True indeed. broken record. And I, I won't reiterate of what I've already said with regard to the 49th state movement, with regard to what happened during the Mexican Revolution, the state of Oklahoma. I mean, the present configuration of the United States of America does not have to be eternal. Uh, nor will it be. Or nor will it be. History has shown us time and time again that d despite the, the grandiose uh, uh, empire that rises up out of a particular geopolitical configuration, that doesn't, ex that doesn't endure. Right. And, but once again, if it changes... It'll need a push, it seems to me, mm, mm. put it mildly, and the push has to be organized, and the push has to be global. Mm, true indeed. Are there any examples from the past that we can follow in sort of uh, developing a template for sovereignty? For instance, here's, here's what I mean. Israel, the state that we currently recognize as Palestine, uh, Vatican, the Vatican didn't exist prior to the 20th century as we know it today. Are there other templates that we can look to 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 draw some lessons from the past and moving forward? Well, if you look at Israel, for example, which comes into existence circa 1947, 1948, mm. it's apparent that the state of Israel came into existence for a number of reasons. One, the Zionist movement basically has its origins in the late 1890s, not least because of the perceived bigotry that those who were Jewish were facing in France in particular. That's right. It's simplified by the Dreyfus case, which your listeners may want to look up. And the conclusion was reached that the only solution for anti-Jewish fervor was a state of the Jewish people. That's and right, for them to separate. Exactly. And to that end, of course, they looked at many different places. They even looked in East Africa, for example, uh, before settling on the British colony that then existed in what we now refer to as Palestine. And the key point I would like to bring to your attention is that that statehood was accomplished and recognized by the major powers of that time. Now... Mm. Let's say that these Africans in North America would like to achieve sovereignty. What powerful states? I'm not even sure if these black intellectuals and leaders know what powerful states exist in the world today. I mean, I hate to say that. I that's guess, right. No, I guess that's they true. heard of China. I guess they heard of <laughs> Russia. I mean, I don't know if they could spot them on a map, though. <laughs> and so, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 we used to be very international, but if you let a muscle fall into disuse, it can atrophy, it can weaken, it can shrivel. And as noted, because of the post-1954 dispensation leading to an erosion of Jim Crow, 
part of the bargain was moving away from internationalism. So mm. it seems to me that those who are sincerely and seriously concerned about the topic you've raised, which is sovereignty, in the first place, it seems to me that the people who you propose to be sovereign need to have amongst their leaders and intellectuals more global consciousness. Because I don't see it happening absent that. Well said. True indeed. And I'm over here taking notes as you're talking. For the listeners, we are going to include links to all of the publications that we've discussed in the show notes. So if you're out running errands and uh, jogging or perhaps you're at the gym, when you get finished, come back to the site where this show is published and you'll find links to all of uh, Dr. Horn's works. And um, I think I want to really briefly return to our history of um, successful revolutions. A lot of people remember the revolutions that took place in Haiti. A lot of people remember the uprisings that took place here in the United States. However, there have been a number of international revolutions that have really changed the face of uh, race relations or contributions to black history, black global history, that I'd like you to touch on very briefly. Well, let's talk about the Haitian Revolution, for example, 1791 to 1804. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that because the next book will be on the Haitian Revolution. It will be out um, next year. But the Haitian Revolution, I, I argue, uh, creates objective conditions that lead to the erosion of slavery in the United States of America. That is to say that if you look at the major slave revolts that take place in North America, they have Haitian fingerprints all over them, for example. Mm. And I also argue in that book that the Haitian Revolution also helped to compel the British and many of the European powers to move away from slavery because, I said, they're not suicide bombers. That's right. You know, a, a good deal of the French planter class and Hispaniola, they were liquidated. I mean, they, they lost their lives. And people, at least the saner, came to recognize that slavery came at a steep price and maybe you need a different social system if you wanted to keep your life. So that was a monumental development in the history of African people in the Americas, although I go on to talk about something that's a bit more sensitive, which is if you look at the map, you'll see that the island of Hispaniola is split between Haiti on the west and Dominican Republic on the east. That's right. And that's a story that's rarely told about how that happened and why that happened, and that's a story that's told in my book. Now, of course, I don't know what other revolutions you, you would be interested in hearing about. Well, of course, we know that there was a slave uprising in Brazil. Brazil is the largest uh, black nation outside of the continent of Africa. Uh, we know that there were a number of other revolutions that took place in places like India amongst the uh, the lower castes. We know that there were uprisings that took place globally around the same time that the uprisings that we popularize here are known to have taken place as well. And so my intention is to give the listeners a more global perspective on this movement towards sovereignty, on this movement towards liberation, and the self-assertion that we as a people have demonstrated in the recent past. Well, first of all, with regard to Brazil, uh, happily, you've mentioned a subject that I've written a book about, the deepest mm -hmm. south, United States, Brazil, and the African slave trade. That's right. Out that one of the reasons why Brazil has more people of African descent than any other state outside of Nigeria is because, once again, of the manic energy of the U.S. slave dealers who were manacling and handcuffing every African in sight, striking mm. them across the Atlantic to toil in Brazil, which, of course, predictably and inevitably leads to slave revolts. But interestingly enough, Brazil does not abolish slavery until 1888. It's one of the final nations uh, to do so. Uh, you mentioned India. Uh, fortunately and happily, I've written a book about India. Mm -hmm end of empires, uh, African right. empires in India, where I talk about the close parallels and relations between the struggle of African people in North America and the struggles in South Asia. Uh, India, as you know, was colonized by the British. There was a monumental liberation struggle in India mm. that culminated in independence in 1947, August 15th a date that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, the father of Pan-Africanism, a founder of the NAACP, considered to be one of the most significant developments in human history. And certainly, if you look at how the newly installed government in New Delhi uh, 
supported African liberation movements in South Africa in particular. M.K. Gandhi, for example, influenced Martin Luther King. That's right. Some of his early years in South Africa at the turn of the 20th century. And of course, South Africa has a large population of South Asian and Indian descent on the eastern coast around Durban, for example. So it was understandable uh, why the Indians uh, would uh, support uh, the anti-apartheid struggle. But the Indians also supported the anti-colonial struggle in Kenya. A subject that I take up in my book, Mau Mau in Harlem, question mark, the uh, mm. United States and liberation of Kenya. And uh, Kenya, too, has a large population of South Asian descent, uh, Mombasa in particular, on the eastern coast, the Indian Ocean coast. That's right. That's words. And uh, New Delhi was very supportive of, of, of that struggle. I guess what we're driving at, of course, is the interlocked relationships between and amongst these struggles. But see, it's interesting, part of the um, personality, if you like, of black Americans, if we can be said to have a personality as right. a group, is that we always have to appear militant, even if we're doing something that's not progressive. That's right. And so, and so if you talk about black, talk to many black Americans about you know, linking up globally, they, all, they always begin to talk about how racist our potential allies are, which means that disqualifies them as allies. But the question is, are they more progressive than the people we're fighting? I mean, that, that's, the, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. See, that, question. That becomes an excuse for not taking that next step and, and basically just sort of uh, suffering here in North America and being subject to the lash mm. of these retrograde, rapacious elements uh, who rule us from Wall Street and Washington. And so it becomes basically an excuse it seems to me. And it also, right. it also becomes an excuse, too, because it's hard enough to try to keep up what's going on in the United States. And so now we're up in the ante. We say, no, you've got to keep up what's going on in the world, not just the United States. Mm. And that's a formidable challenge, uh, which I, and obviously it's a challenge that has to be met collectively. True indeed. But to a degree, it also has to be met individually. It reminds me of, of the struggles in the academy, in universities, when some of our more backward uh, Euro-American professors were complaining about diversifying the curriculum. Mm. Now, one of the reasons was they, they would have to work harder. I mean, they'd have to learn <laughs> history. And people don't want to work harder. They want to work less. God forbid. But, but then again, they can't admit that that's at the nub of the question, that they'd have to work harder. And so likewise, what I'm suggesting would call for our people to work harder. I mean, you know... You, you got to keep up with what's going on in the world. You have to know what the BRICS are. You have to know what the AU is. That's right. You have to know what CARICOM is. I mean, come on. Uh, pe people say, you know, I can hardly figure out what the NFL is, <laughs> let alone CARICOM. That's right. That's right. And, you know, arguably people make more space for the NFL than they do for their geopolitical awareness, which is, you know, to our detriment. Now, the the the. The tag of militancy, the militant jacket, is so often thrown on elements of our movement that don't necessarily match up with the mainstream, so to speak. Do you think that's a jacket that's thrown on elements of the movement intentionally to discredit them? Or do you really believe that the militant aspects of the movement are, are detrimental? Do you think that's something we should start taking a step back from? Well, I'm all for militancy, but it depends on what you mean. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, I think we have to be aggressive. That's right. We have to be, from time to time, confrontational. I think from time to time, we have to get in people's faces. That's right. Oh, of course, all of this has to be done on an intelligent basis. I mean, I mean, one of my rules of thumb is, is, is to try to avoid fighting people who don't have any power. Uh, mm. Because if you fight people who don't have any power, even if you win, you haven't won anything. True and indeed. So, some people are, are confrontational with the wrong people. I mean, they're confrontational with their neighbors who don't have any power, <laughs> but not confrontational necessarily with the landlord who does have power. So, uh, and I also recognize that when the United States was moving to the right, the, which seems to be perpetually the case, mm. inevitably the so-called militant jacket would be placed upon some of our leaders in order to discredit them. And that's something that has to be taken into account, taken into consideration. I, I guess what I'm saying is that uh, politics, it's a very sophisticated chess game. And therefore, Indeed. one has to be shrewd. One has to be intelligent. 
mm. about how one conducts the struggle. Uh, one has to try to engage in sophisticated tactics. One has to try to isolate the reactionaries. If you can't isolate them domestically, you have to isolate them globally. That's right. One has to build global and international alliances. Uh, I mean, this is what politics is all about. Mm. So from where we stand now, how do we begin to build those relationships, those global alliances that you talked about frequently? Well, many of us are members of organizations. I, I think one of the turning points in our history is when the NAACP decided to move away from internationalism, when they fired W.B. Du Bois in 1948 and basically accepted the deal, which was throw overboard Du Bois and Paul Robeson in turn for these anti-Jim Crow concessions. I think mm. we need to impel and compel the NAACP to apologize for that move, particularly firing their founder. True indeed. And then after they apologize, we have to then set them on the right course, the proper course, which is not only, for example, maintaining an office in Washington, uh, but maintaining offices in Brasilia and Cape Town and Moscow and Beijing, etc. Or at least uh, establishing contacts there. True indeed. And meetings there and, and conferring there. And the same holds true for the other organizations that purport to represent us. Mm. The same holds true for the Congressional Black Caucus, which admittedly uh, has constraints because they're paid representatives of the U.S. government. Absolutely. Which means uh, that they don't have the freedom of movement and latitude that some of us do. Uh, but I think that they can hold hearings on this kind of question. I mean, these, these CBC members, they're perpetually on junkets abroad. That's right. Uh, I don't think it would be improper for them to carry out tasks for our movement abroad. After all, they're paid to represent us. So I think that students uh, need to be involved with what used to be called the National Student Association. I think it's called the U.S. Student Association now, which has international affiliates mm. and uh, has an international outreach that we have to be involved in. I think that in terms of uh, our protests, there were 150 protests within the, the days after Ferguson and the failure to return an indictment. That's right. I think that those organizing those protests have to make sure that on their press lists who, or you know, RT, RT of Moscow and Prince of Latina of Cuba and press Absolutely. Of and because, you know, they will give you coverage, uh, unlike CNN and New York Times, uh, etc. Absolutely. Which may not give you coverage. And if they do, you might have wished that they hadn't given you coverage, <laughs> given the bias and the prejudice and the distortion that's embedded in their coverage. That's and right. Indeed, that puts competitive pressure on them to pull up their socks. That's right. Once they know that we've gone over their heads to their competitors. So these are just a few random thoughts that can be followed up on. Very valuable insights as well. Uh, we discussed at length about how when we were on the ground in Ferguson, the uh, elements of the media that were most willing to give us airtime, that were most willing to allow us to you know, openly discuss our frustrations and talk about what was going on from our perspective, were elements of uh, uh, foreign media. Uh, and so I can't underestimate the importance of us reaching out to those elements because the coverage is what Al Jazeera used to be, what Al Jazeera was prior to their acquisition. At the beginning of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, it was clear, unbiased, and uncensored coverage of what was going on, not only on the battlefield, but on the political battlefield as well. And so I, I think that is vital. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking to African-American historian Gerald Horn, chair of history at the University of Houston. Dr. Horn, it has been an absolute pleasure. I'm humbled. Uh, You've written a lot. You've made a lot of contributions to the community. I want you to discuss projects that you're currently working on that are coming up in the near future and how we can stay in touch. Well, as I said, I have a book on the Haitian Revolution and the origins of the Dominican Republic coming out next fall. I'm writing a short biography of Paul Robeson, the great actor and activist. And mm. I'm doing it for a British publisher, and it should be out next year. Then after that, I'm going to write a book on um, the black press. Uh, Beautiful. More specifically, the Associated Negro Press, which was really an amazing institution. It was in existence from about 1918 to 1967 and 
had writers all over the world mm. filing stories, employed some of the greatest writers in our community, including Richard Wright and Zora Neale Hurston. Mm. And part of the paradox is, is that as Jim Crow begins to crumble, which in many ways was a step forward, that That's right. powerful institution also begins to crumble, which was not a step forward. It's, it's part of the paradox of our struggle. And I'm going to do a book on aviation uh, because from the formal or the, shall we say, recognized advent of flight, say December 1903, with the mm -hmm. right, at least in the United States, they're given credit for the airplane, although we know that even before 1903, you had U.S. Negroes trying to invent flying contraptions, trying to figure out a way how to get out of this hellhole. <laughs> but from the advent, recognized advent of flight, uh, you had black people who were interested in airplanes. So I'm going to trace that struggle and uh, what it meant and you know, the battle, you know, how planes were used against us, for example, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and North Africa, Libya. That's right. 1911, which was one of, one of the first attempts to use uh, airplanes to bomb people from the air. That's right. And, Black Wall Street. Uh, yeah. And so the, then i got to write that. Then I'm, I'm writing a book on pro-Tokyo Negroes because in the period up to 1945, the end of World War II, you had a lot of black nationalists in particular who were pro-Japan and we worked hand in glove with Japan. I, mm. I wrote about that in a previous book called Race War, but mm. it's a subject I can't stay away from, so I'm going into it in more detail. And what, then, what's, what's the drive here? Some of us have trouble producing an article, and yet you've produced uh, a, a small library of volumes, and you're continuing to produce. What's the drive here? Um, clean living. That's the key. <laughs> clean living. Well, no, I mean, I think, uh, I don't know, it's sort of hard to examine myself. I mean, I, I think that part of the key, speaking objectively, is that I mean, I'm a firm opponent of child labor, but at the same time, I started working at the age of seven or eight selling newspapers, <laughs> and I began reading newspapers, picking mm. up the lifelong habit and, you know, migrating from the comic strips to the sports page, to mm. the news pages, et cetera, and then platforming that to going into reading short biographies and, and then writing. Mm reading and uh, you know I've always been interested in politics and um, I've, I've found that temperamentally that writing suits me temperamentally in, in mm. many ways. by that I mean it's it's something I can accomplish I mean I, I've also been involved in politics which is uh, you know I've been <laughs> I've been sitting on Mount Olympus for the last 40 minutes <laughs> pontificating about politics but politics is hard True indeed, and uh, it's 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 hard. That's that's why we have so much difficulty in winning victories. And personally, I've found that writing suits me temp more temperamental. It suits me temperamentally mm. more than organized politics, which I've been, which I've also been involved in. Mm. So I don't know. I, I have to leave it to somebody else to analyze myself. Just curious. Just curious. I always marvel at our, our warriors and scholars who have volumes and volumes of works that they're leaving behind as their legacy for us. And, you know, it's, it's just it's easy to marvel at, at, at these feats from our positions. But we, we're definitely uh, humbled and we appreciate those contributions. We pour over the scrolls that you all leave behind, uh, you in particular, and uh so you are still the chair of history at the University of Houston, is that right? Well, I have an endowed chair. I mean, more okay, so, I'm okay, an administrative chair. Now, when all that means that I have a budget to travel and do research. No doubt, no doubt. What uh, changes have you noticed over the years in the disposition of the students that are coming through the halls of academia? Well, that's a good question. Um... Again, my my curiosity has peaked from an educator's <laughs> perspective. Uh, no, I, I think Ferguson has stirred these students, which is good. That's right. Uh, because, hey, these students, they, they better get stirred because, let me tell you, I mean, mm. people who, who run the country have some plans for them. That's that are, right. They may not approve of. I mean, for example, you have uh, computers now that are doing the jobs of journalists in terms of writing simple articles. That's right. You have law jobs, jobs as lawyers that are being outsourced to India and the Philippines, and therefore law schools are going to be closing like crazy in the next few years. Mm. You have the growing robotization movement, 
whereby jobs and factories in particular are going to be done by robots. You have jobs like taxis, for example, which are being undermined by these computer applications like Uber and Lyft, L-Y-F-T. And the same thing is happening with regard to hotel jobs, with regard to Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Um, Completely disruptive technologies. Exactly. And so... And then if you look at some of these these new huge corporations like Instagram, they don't employ that many people compared to, say, Kodak. It's That's right. It's its predecessor. And so where are people going to work in order to survive? It's a very dystopian future mm. that's being envisioned for many of us. And I take very serious, you know, not only do I take very serious, the Financial Times of London, which is a newspaper of the elite that's right they've been writing some very serious articles lately about how they're concerned about the growth in computer power and how the computer supercomputers may decide that these humans are irrelevant that's now, right financial times <laughs> in and so when i when i read stories like that and then i look at all these billionaires who are trying to figure out how to get it into outer space because you know this meeting is taking place in lima peru as we speak about climate change and there was a head, a startling headline in the new york times yesterday which says if this meeting is not successful we may be facing the prospect of human extinction on planet earth that's right so and so i said oh, okay so there it's real <laughs> let's, let's try to scoot off to another planet <laughs> sends into chaos. So I'm happy to see that today's youth are getting energized and involved because, quite frankly, I don't think they have a choice. True indeed. True indeed. Well, the uh, the latter questions were more to pique my curiosity than for the uh, enjoyment of the listening audience. However, I think they'll enjoy it as well. It's always, it's always uh, enlightening to hear the perspectives of our warrior scholars. Dr. Horn, we know your time is valuable. We're going to go ahead and cut the interview short. We sincerely appreciate you visiting us here at United Black America Radio. Um, is there anything that we have not asked you that you would like to uh, to talk about? Well, I can't think of something, although I'm sure as soon as we hang up, I'll think of something. That's how it works. Well, you're always welcome. Our platform is your platform. Hey, definitely our pleasure. I was over here taking a few notes on things I need to follow up on, and I ended up with three pages. So I have some work to do. My pleasure. All right. Peace.